Hardwired for generosity. That's what we are. So I'm going to give you a brief summary of what I spoke about last week. God wants our first and our best. God wants our first and our best. He wants our first and our best of our hearts. When Jesus has our hearts, He becomes our treasure. God wants the first and best of our living. As the kingdom of God becomes our highest focus and priority, then we learn to trust our Heavenly Father as our provision. That's what we do. And God wants the first and the best of our giving, the tithe, the the tenth of all that we earn, the first of our money. And I said it's biblical, it belongs to the Lord, and we should neglect to do it. Secondly, it's a test, it tests our heart. Nothing, I said this last week, nothing tests us more than money. When you have it or when you don't, it tests our hearts. And then thirdly, there's a benefit to tithing. God provides as the shepherd of our lives, but he provi- the tithe provides for the shepherds that he's placed in local churches like ours to care for the flock, and it enables the church to do the work that God has set aside for us to do. I believe that being part and parcel of our lives, of being wired, hardwired for generosity, is to understand that we need to be smart with our money. Be money smart. And I know this is difficult, but this is what God wants us to do. He wants us to manage our money well. Let me rephrase that. He wants us to manage His money well. That's what He wants us to do. The Scriptures say this, For from Him, and through Him, and to Him, all things come. All things come from Him, all things come through Him, all things are for Him. So what God wants us to do is to manage what He has put into our lives well. And out of that, give Him the glory. So you're ready. Are you nervous? I do believe this, is that we, if we are smart with our money, if we are smart with our money, it gives us joy. It gives us freedom. It also helps us create and keep momentum in our finances and our lives. True story. As soon as there's financial chaos, everything seems to fall apart. Am I correct? It's a terrible thing. I, think, I don't think there's more anxiety that we experience than when there's no money. It's a terrible thing. However, being, being money smart doesn't come naturally to us. It's not a natural thing for people to be smart with their finances. Like it doesn't seem to be natural for us to be smart with our living. For example, if we keep ignoring our hearts, and the Bible describes our hearts as wicked and deceptive, then what we will do if we ignore our hearts we will quickly short-circuit our hard wideness for generosity. And we end up doing something dumb with our finances and our money. If our hearts aren't in check with God, we cannot afford to ignore our hearts. We need to check in with ourselves. It's a very, very necessary thing of our walk with Jesus is we need to, we need to self-audit we need to check in. We don't do that. We need to do much more of that in our lives. We, we need to be more honest with ourselves. We need to be more honest with God. But because life is busy and there are kids and there's homework and there's sport and there's pressure and masks and sanitizer, we put sanitizer on our sanitizer to sanitize the other sanitizer. That is stressful. And when you put on your mask... And it's the wrong size. And your ears, my ears were weird anyway. But now I can hear everything because they're like this boy. So I'm going to help you. You know, some notes. Just, I don't know if you can remember. And we'll send out this for you during the week if you want. But this is some questions you can ask with regards to self-auditing, which we don't do and we don't do enough of. And I'm going to encourage you as a church. Self-audit. Check on your heart. Every now and then I go for a, to a specialist and he checks my heart, how my heart condition. He puts me on a treadmill, puts all sorts of things on me and he checks if I'm okay. If I'm not okay, I need to get better or I need to take a pill or something like that. If I don't do that, I'm going to drop down dead. So I don't want to die early. I go for regular checkups. Yearly or bi-yearly. That's regular for me. Ask this question. Number one, question one. You have to be honest. How am I doing with Jesus 
So I often ask the question, is it well with your soul? People say, yo, 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 it's well with your soul. Then I ask this question, how's it going with Jesus? That's a much more hard question because we don't think about that. It's a good question. How am, I, how am I doing, Lord? Are we okay? Are we good? Are we enjoying each other's presence? Here's how you answer that question. Or ask another question. Am I unapologetic for my faith in Christ? Am I unapologetic for my faith in Christ? It doesn't matter who says something about Jesus or how they say something about Jesus or what they believe is right or wrong. Am I unapologetic, unashamed about my faith in Jesus Christ? And am I undivided in my devotion to Jesus? And only you can answer that question. No one else can answer that question for you. Am I undivided in my de devotion to Jesus? So here's four easy self-audit questions with to, to try and find out the truth of that, uh, those, those questions. One, am I in His Word? And is His Word in me? Am I in His Word? If you're a Jesus follower, you need to be in His Word. When a person comes to Christ, one of the first things I do is I give them a Bible. And I say, read Mark. And maybe read some of the stuff in the front of the book, but just read it. Just read it. Because if you're in the Word, the Word will get in you. And when the Word is in you, your faith will be able to hook on to God. Faith comes from hearing Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what it says. Faith comes from hearing about the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we, it attaches, faith comes by hearing the Word of God. It attaches, Jesus is the Word of God. Our faith attaches onto the Word of God. Secondly, am I living His way or am I doing my thing? Jesus' followers have to ask those questions. We can't just carry on doing what we want to do. Am I living His way? Here's why, I'm asking, ask, why I ask this question myself. Because am I living His way, I will thrive. That's the fact. The Word says, I've come to give you abundant life. That our lives should be flourishing. We should be very fruitful. If I am in Christ, I should, there should be evidence in my life there is fruit in me. You see people think, oh, coming to Jesus is such a religious thing to do. And, it, and it's, like a, it's like up and down and it's like a grind. Let me tell you something. When you're in Jesus, it's the best life. You thrive. You flourish. Not always easy, but your life is good. You have peace in your heart. You have joy in your spirit. You have steadfastness. It's amazing. Am I living His way or am I doing my own thing? Third question. Am I doing His works or am I too busy building my castle? Am I doing His work or am I too busy building my castle? Don't feel bad. We all have to do work. We all have to graft. We all have to make money, etc., etc., but what we do with our lives and what we do with our businesses as a Jesus follower should be for Him. Everything we do is for Him. Is that right? That's good self-audit. Am I doing it for Him? Am I just grinding? I want a promotion. Of course you should have a promotion. I believe Jesus followers should be promoted. If you work hard, lazy Jesus followers should be fired. Fourth question. Am I surrendered to his will, or am I stubbornly holding on to mine? See, we got to ask these questions. Because if we don't, truth is, we will ignore our hearts. And here's the thing about us. Here's the thing about us. We are easily deceived. And our minds are often blinded by our sense of self-importance. And by greed. And by envy. Covetousness lurks in the shadows of discontent. We crave the things of this world. We, we want them. And it's like in the shadows of our souls, we're so discontent. You know, even the Bible warns us about worldly wisdom. And the Bible warns us about the patterns of this world's living. It warns us. And those patterns and those, those mindsets that we have, the worldly mindset we have, they often make us make unwise decisions plunge us into ruin. I've seen it. Some of you have experienced it. It's so important for us to check out our hearts. Not only that, not only that, we underestimate the power of money. 
And we underestimate the pull that it has on our lives, on our egos, on our lifestyle. Whether we have money or not, money has power. How do we know? Because we chase after it. How do we know money has power and pull? Because we love it. We hold onto it tightly. We waste it. We flaunt it. We serve it. We allow it to be our master, our destiny. And rich and poor fall for this. We are not immune to this reality in our lives. And either we become self-sufficient because of money or we feel insignificant because of the lack of money. And the true story is money has power because we give it its power. And money has power because we give money the authority over our lives. We do that. Money is an in and that's a warm-up, an animate object. It's just money. But it has power when we give it authority to have power over us. Jesus said this, you cannot worship two gods at once. Loving one God, you'll end up hating the other. Adoration of one feeds contempt for the other. You cannot worship God and money both. You cannot. Jesus said that. The most obvious way to give money, power, and authority over our lives is by getting into financial debt. Be money smart. So here's a warning. Beware of debt. Now don't go quiet on me. Because I've been there. And it's a horrible hole. And, it's, and it kills the soul. Oh, I'm going to rap. I can feel it coming. <laughs> Paul wrote to the Roman church. He says, Oh, no man anything except the debt of love. Don't owe man any Don't owe any money. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower becomes the lender slave. That's what the proverb says. And the true story is that's what debt does to us. It makes us slaves. It takes away our joy. It takes away our freedom. It disconnects our hard wideness for generosity. Let me put it this way. You ready? Watch out for Black Friday. It'll turn into the Monday blues. Watch out for Black Friday. Because Black Friday becomes the Monday blues like that. Yes, we are hardwired for generosity, but debt short circuits us. Wicked borrows and never returns. Righteous give and gives. Generous gets it all in the end. Stingy is cut off from the past. And that's our reality. We think that we can creep into bed with debt and never get caught out, and no one will know. But it's an affair everybody knows about. We are, we are responsible for our financial situation. And with debt, we will live with regret. And here's the story I want you to hear about I overheard in the kitchen. Can you switch it on? There we go. Good morning. Let me see. Hold on. There we go. Okay, good morning. So on Friday nights, we have Alpha, and we've been spoiling everyone with beautiful pizza. And we've trained some mini chefs. Ah, sto imparando. They're still learning. Anyway, and so what happens is the pizza kits come, two pizzas, one pack of paste, and one pack of cheese per two pizzas. That means you have to be good at maths. Divide it equally so that everyone gets enough. But there was a little bit of a mishap on Friday night. What happened, Mariska? Do you want to take him? Yes. 
So I'm, I'm a very social cook, and you know, in the kitchen, I'm just talking so much that I didn't realize that I used all the cheese on one pizza. So, you know, she was having fun. She was in the moment. It was fun. There was nothing wrong. It was healthy fun. It's all good. And she used all the pizza, cheese. So she's turned around. She said to me, Lee, don't worry. There's another packet of cheese. We can just open that. And I turned to Mariska and I said, Mariska, let me teach you a lesson on debt, my darling. Now what's going to happen is you loved it. It was good. There was nothing wrong. It was one, but you borrowed from the future for today because this had not enough. And it's easy. It's not, nothing wrong with it. You just use a little bit of it up. But then when you come to the end, you're going to have lost a lot because you're not going to have anything left over. And there was nothing wrong here but it caught up. Lesson in debt. Jesus loves the cheeses. <laughs> the, spiral, the spiral of debt is a terrifying thing for us because it, it, it eats away at our lives. It costs us more than we realize. It actually can destroy our souls. Listen to what Jesus says. I'm reading from the message version from the Gospel of Luke. It says this, Is there anyone here who planning to build a new house doesn't first sit down and figure the costs so that you'll know you can complete it? If you only get the foundations laid and then run out of money, you're going to look pretty foolish. Everyone passing the wall will poke fun at you. He started something he couldn't finish. Here's the deal. If you can't afford it, you can't have it. That's the rule. That's the universal rule. But it's, it's not true, because if you can't afford it, just go into debt and get it. If you do debt, debt will undo you. So let me talk a little bit about this. It's not an easy subject, but this could change your life and this could save your life. It could save your marriage. It could save your kids. You might stop driving into the bay today if you can just listen to what God has for you. Greed will change your need. Greed will change your need. For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And then Jesus said this, Beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Life is much more. This goes back to our hearts, doesn't it? First things first. So I want to encourage you. One, if you're in debt, own it. Don't hide it. Now, some of us, it's hard because no one knows we're in debt except the bank or the loan shark or whatever it is. And you need to come clean. You need to, first of all, be honest with yourself. And then secondly, you need to be honest with those around you. Let me say this. Discontentment will feed your greed. Did you get that? Discontentment will feed your greed. Greed will change your need. Your need will become a want. Discontentment will feed your greed. The more discontent you are, the more you want. Listen to what the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6. But godliness is actually a means of great gain. Godliness is actually, when you find Jesus, it's great gain. You gain, you don't lose when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into this world, so we cannot take anything out of this world. I've never seen in all my days a hearse with a trailer on the back. Taking the person stuff with them so they can have it when they die. When you die, it all stays here. Scary, eh? I said to Lee last night, I said, I looked at our house last night and I saw it empty. And then I walked around the house and I thought, 
Okay, what don't I need? I know that terrifies Leanne because I love giving stuff out, eh? And I, and I boiled it down, I'd end up with like four things in my house that I would keep. The rest, hey, burn it or give it away. Best burn it because there's lots of borer. <laughs> then the scripture says this, if you have food and covering, these shall make you content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men and women into ruin and destruction. Discontentment will increase your debt. That's what discontentment does. It'll make you want more. Watch out for the subtleties of discontentment. You know, I've got this car. Hey, but have you seen the new model? Mm -mm. I've got this TV set. And it's flat. Have you seen the, the new curved one? <laughs> I don't understand why you have to have a curved TV, but apparently they're awesome. Have you seen Mascatulus? <laughs> but have you seen the proper ones? Mm. Watch out for the subtleties of discontent. The world around us makes us discontent with life. And we will quickly fall into debt. And comparativeness, comparing ourselves with other people, or looking at them, creates covetousness. And then greed stirs up within us. And then we want it. And then we become discontent because we don't have it. Comparativeness stokes the fires of discontent. And it is soul-destroying. Because we know most of the stuff we want, we can't have. I can't have. I have a red two-door Italian sports car. It's called the Fiat 500. It's supposed to be a Ferrari. You've got to watch when wants become needs. You see how important it is for us to be honest with ourselves and when that happens when wants become needs it leads us into debt greed turns needs into wants discontentment feeds our greed debt makes us eat our seed that's what debt does the seed we need to sow so that we can live is what becomes our food and that's the wrong thing to do for God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he'll provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. The wise have wealth and luxury, but fools spend whatever they get. Don't be stupid. Don't be foolish. Be, be money smart. Debt stops flow. That's what it does to a grinding halt. Seed for sowing is quickly gobbled up in debt. And seed is God's way out of debt. You got that? I'm not saying this is taking out the little blue genie and running if I throw money. I'm in so much debt. I'm in a million rands debt. I've got some money. I'll take out my credit card. I'll seed. <laughs> no, you won't. You'll just go to jail quicker. You know what I mean? You can't take out your credit card to seed God. He knows what you're doing. That's what debt does to us. It takes away the flow. It dries us up. It stops what God has for our lives. Debt will make us eat our seed. What we need to do is trust the Lord to meet our need. But trust Him His way. You got it? Trust in the Lord and He will make your path straight. He will level out the valleys and the hills for you. But you have to trust in Him and trust in His ways. And ultimately, 
that's trusting in Him and His Word. When God asks us, you and me, individually, let's say individually first, everybody sitting in a chair, when God asks you to do something audacious for Him, radical, outrageous for Him, can you afford to do it? If you have debt, you can't. If you have debt, you can never do anything outrageous for God because whatever you give away that's not yours is illegal. And you know, also I think if we are discontent, not only that, if we, we're discontent with our lives, the chances are we won't do something audacious for God because we want to do something audacious for ourselves. So here's the way out of debt. I'm going to give you four ways to get out of debt. Number one, don't let debt paralyze you. That's what happens. I've seen it. It's like, ah, you can't do anything. You can't think. Money is money. Money is an inanimate object, but it has power when we give us authority over our lives. And that's what I said earlier. That's what debt does. So don't let it paralyze you. It's just money. So you need to make some decisions. Remember the paralysis of analysis. Trying to figure it out, we just get stuck. And we go nowhere quickly. So take back the authority of your finances. Take it back. Don't let it trap you. It's just money. But if you're in debt, it's much more than money. You know what I feel. You feel very attached to it because now there's authority over you. Take it back. You need to be honest with it. Get it into the light. I'm in debt. I've had people in this church come to me through the years. My life's falling apart. Ah, Brett, but I must tell you why. I'm in debt. And then they tell me, and that's why I started going for ECGs. Heart attack material. You know what I mean? Take back the authority. Get it into the light. He who is in the light will have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness. If you're not in the light, you break fellowship. And when you break fellowship, it's a disaster. You cannot do that. You cannot afford that. Don't walk in darkness. Don't give any more power to debt over your life. Own it. Get it out into the, into the open. And remember that we are meant to be managers of God's money, not slaves to money and debt. That's what we're meant to be. We're meant to be managers of the finances. God's entrusted us, not meant to be slaves to it. So don't let it paralyze you. And I've seen that people can't make good decisions. They can't think properly. It just, they just don't know what to do. They become overwhelmed. And so they just, the debt just keeps piling. Step number two, learn to be a good money manager. Become a good and faithful steward. Make that decision. Today, I choose to be a good and faithful steward of what God has entrusted to me. And if you've got debt, He never entrusted debt to you. But what you need to do is you need to make a plan to get out of that debt. So choose. I choose to be a good. Make that confession to the Lord. I choose to be responsible for where I've got myself, Lord, and I will choose to get out of that by being a good, faithful steward. Be faithful with what God's trusted you. Manage His money well. So here's what it means for me. You need to be bold to step out of debt. Remember, it's a spirit. It's like the force against God. You can't serve God and money. And the word is mammon. It's like this living thing because it has authority over us. We can't do that. So we need to be bold. We need to step out of debt so we can step into the freedom of God's grace and His provision by faith. And then we need to stand on His word. I love that song we were singing earlier, that we all stand on His word and His promises. That's what we do. We need to be bold Jesus followers to stand on the truth of God's Word and to take hold of His promises, regardless of whether you're in debt or not. But if you're in debt, even more so. So let's do this. So this is what the Scripture says in 1 Timothy chapter, 2 Timothy chapter uh, 1, verse 7. It says this, But God has not given you a spirit of fear or timidity, but He has given you a spirit of love and power and discipline. So you need to be bold. And then secondly, so this is what the script in Hebrew says. So, so let the, let's, do the, let's do it. Full of belief, confident that we, we're presentable inside and out. Let's keep a firm grip on the promises that keep us going. Always 
keep His Word. Hold on to God's Word. I've noticed the pattern in a person's life. Jesus follows. You get into debt. You mustn't feel guilty. You must understand. You see what debt does. Debt makes us sit in spaces of our spirituality that we should never sit. We have all these weird things going on inside of us. We don't know how to get rid of the guilt and the shame and the mess that we made. Well, say I choose no more debt. Get out of it. So, four steps to get out. One, check in with yourself. Check in with yourself. Today is your check-in. When you go home, check in with yourself. Learn to be honest with yourself and God. Self-audit the way I suggested and ask God for help and wisdom. That's how you check in. Lord, I need your help. And I need your wisdom. Step two, to get out of debt and to be debt-free. Get yourself out of it. Get yourself out of debt. Don't wait for someone else to get you out of debt. I know a lot of Christians are praying, oh Lord, you know that Richard in my church, I just pray, Lord, do you speak to him? Speak to him now, Lord, so he can come and pay my debt off. That's not going to happen. you got to get yourself out of debt. Make a plan to get out of debt as soon as possible. Put a budget together as soon as possible. Put the first and the best at the top of your budget. Don't leave it for leftovers. First and best of your heart, of your living and your giving. Put it there in your budget. Cut off the fat as soon as possible. Yeah, I've got this in my budget, I've got that in my budget. Well, a lot of stuff in our budget we don't need. Just make sure you've got food and you can pay the lights. That's enough. Don't worry, well, I'm also saving for my second car and I'm saving for this, but I've got so much debt. No, no, you're not saving for your second car. That money is going to pay off your debt. Start paying off some of the debt as soon as possible. Pay. Some is better than none. And if, you're, if uh, the bank or whoever you owe money to are, are sending demanding letters, don't shut them down and throw them in the waste paper basket because they'll send someone around. Don't ignore it. Deal with it. Integrity deals. Financial integrity deals with debt properly. So start dealing with it properly. Pay off some of the debt. If you owe, for example, 100 rand, but you don't have 100 rand, but in your wallet you have 15 rand, phone the bank and say, I've got 10 rand I'll give you today. Because you need buy bread with five. Okay? Okay? The longer, the longer we leave debt in our lives, the stronger the hold of debt has over us. So learn or lean in to being good stewards of what God has entrusted you. Third step of being out of debt. Is this okay? Are you okay? When it's part of being hardwired. You see, debt disconnects our hardwiredness for generosity, and we are created in the image of God to be generous. So we need to stop that so God can use us for His glory, that our lives can thrive. Step three towards being debt-free. Simplify. Simplify. I'm going to say it again. Simplify. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For He Himself has said, I will never leave you and I will never desert you. So simplify. Just simplify. If you've got stuff you don't need, sell it. So you can pay off your debt. We were in debt when we were young. And we started the church. We were midway through our ch the church life. And uh, we, just, we were just unstuck. The finances were, were struggling in the life of the church. But there was just some stuff. And our debt was mounting. And so Leah and I just came clean with God. We spoke it out. We got to get out of this. We want to be wise managers of what God has entrusted into our lives. And we had timeshare that we bought for our family when we were young, and we got it as an absolute miracle. When people ask, how did you manage to go to Champagne Sports Resort? It's because there was a guy who was getting divorced, and they didn't like each other, so they sold their timeshare to spite each other. And we were there at the right time. So, you know what I mean? Like a crafty little uh, uh, fox I am, eh? And so I could afford it. We like found some pennies when we were young, and, and our family could go on a regular holiday. But then... Life happens, doesn't it? Now kids are at school and da 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 da, and I'm not blaming my kids that they've cost me a lot of money because they have. I don't blame them, I just tell them. And the thing is this is that 
we needed a certain amount of money to get out of debt because we just felt like we weren't moving forward, we weren't making progress. And I said to Leanne, why don't we just sell our timeshare? We don't know what the value is, but let's just tell it. She said, oh, but you know, they'll cheat and all that. Well, we've got to get rid of this because it's going to strangle us. So you know what we did? We phoned the Oaks who sold it to us. We said, listen, we got this timeshare. I hadn't finished my sentence. They said, well, they paid us more than we could imagine for our timeshare. We got out of that debt, and we paid off all our other debts with that. Simplify. I still have holidays, but now I can afford with cash money. You with it? Lean into a content life by making wise lifestyle choices. Live an uncluttered life. Less is more. That's true. No one needs to know. Let me say this. For those of you who have lots of money, no one needs to know you've got lots of money. So don't drive it. And don't live in it and flash it. Keep it to yourself. Honor the Lord with that. Be wise. Because you're going to have a lot of people knocking at your door wanting some cash. And if you don't have money, you don't have to live like you're poor. Keep life simple. Make a plan. Get out of debt. Keep your life simple because your Father knows what you need. Fourth step, and we're out. Seed it. Seed it. Stay focused on the kingdom. I believe this is a stage that all of us can get up either hyper-spiritual and weird, or we can go, I can't do that. But I'm talking about genuine Jesus followers embracing a kingdom principle of sowing and reaping. This is the faithful stage of getting out of debt. Seed it, and you will see it. Seed it. But seed what you don't owe. Seed something that you know is yours, it's free, no one can take it from you. If, if it's debt, someone's going to take it from you. If you want to see financial growth in your life, seed for it. That's how it works. If you want to see an oak tree, then don't go praying for an oak tree. Put the acorn in the ground. That's how oak tree grows. If you want carrots, Go to Woolworths. <laughs> Last verse. Trust the Lord to meet your needs. He who sows in the Spirit will reap of the Spirit. Seed your heart to the Lord. Seed your life to the Lord. Seed your first and your best to the Lord. Seed it to the Lord. Seed in the spiritual realm and you'll reap in the physical as well. Don't be misled. This is what Paul says in Galatians. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You'll always harvest what you plant. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from the sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. I'll tell you what is good. Get out of debt. That is good. Start getting hardwired again for generosity. Just at the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Debt doesn't disappear overnight. It's a process. You got into debt in a process. You get out of debt in a process. But get out of debt and remain hardwired for generosity. Amen? Did it work? Praise the Lord. Okay. If you're not in debt, please stand. If you're not in any debt, please stand. Okay, so everybody stand. I'll pray for you if you're in debt. Okay? You look around, you go, oh, we're in trouble in this church. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> Come on. Let's be. Let's be. How's this? How's this? Let's be honest. We can be honest here. We are very honest people, eh? Let's be, let's be real. Why don't we aim 
2022, the first church family, and everyone in this church family is debt free. Hey? Have you got faith for that? Now, I'm not a weird, like, okey pokey for that. But I really believe if we follow the principles of God, we can be a debt free family of God, each of us. We're going to have to learn to do life together to do this. That means we might have to help each other out. Is that okay? But here's the deal. When God asks for something audacious from us, our hands are the first ones up because we got the cash to do it. We'll do it for the Lord, whatever it is.